to one of our afternoon sessions. It's titled New Discoveries in Lenape History and Archaeology. Uh, I'm Rich Veit uh, from Monmouth University, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this session. Um, at Monmouth, I serve as the Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I'm also a professor of anthropology, and I'm very honored to serve as a member of the New Jersey Historical Commission. We're going to have three presentations in this session. Um, the first is by Richard Adamsick. Uh, the second will be by Douglas Almick, and the third will be by Adam Heinrich. Uh, I'm gonna start off by introducing Richard and his presentation. Uh, I would wanna remind you that if you have questions, you should use the Q&A function at the bottom of uh, your Zoom screen. We're not able to use the chat during our presentations. So uh, Richard Adam Sick's presentation is titled Pre-Contact Archaeology at the William Trent House Native American Settlement in Trenton, New Jersey. Richard is an archaeologist at Richard Grubb and Associates Incorporated, a consulting firm for the management of cultural and heritage resources. He also serves as the curator of the Alan E. Carmen Museum of Prehistory in Cumberland County, New Jersey. And if you haven't been, it's certainly worth a trip. Mr. Adams, its education and experience are focused on the pre-contact Native American and historical archeology span of the Mid-Atlantic region with a special research interest in lower Delaware Valley prehistory, early colonial history, underwater archeology, span and going a bit further afield, the archeology span of the Caribbean islands. So without further ado, let me turn the presentation over to Richard and let's hear about the Trent House. Thank you so much, Dr. Veit. Let me just get my screen shared here. All right, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, so my presentation is on the pre-contact archaeology that we had um, uncovered at the William Trent House site. In the summer of 2019, uh, Monmouth University and the historic preservation firm Hunter Research hosted an archaeological field school at the Trent House site in downtown Trenton. The goal of our excavations was to investigate a series of anomalies identified by a ground penetrating radar survey in the hopes of uncovering early historic structures. However, we also recovered a wealth of Native American artifacts that predated the European occupation of the property, which gave us an excellent opportunity to research the original inhabitants of the Trenton area. My research used the results of the 2019 excavations as a primary data source, while using the findings from previous investigations that Hunter Research conducted to support the interpretations. Let's see. So the Trent House site is located on the eastern bank of the Delaware River, approximately 500 feet from the river's modern shoreline. But in fact, the river shoreline was even closer to the property in prehistoric times. This map shows the ancient shoreline and the approximate location of the Douglas Gut, which is a now filled waterway that once flowed south of the Trent House. Uh, and this area of the Delaware River is referred to as the Falls of the Delaware. It is the head of the tide and a shallow point in the river, which would have been able to be crossed on foot and the abrupt change in depth called migrations of fish, a key food resource to gather in the area. The Assenpink Creek also empties into the Delaware just over a quarter mile to the Northwest of the site. And pre-contact Native American sites are known to frequently occur along the Delaware River as well as near the Assenpink Creek within downtown Trenton. And the confluence of these two waterways was a critical factor in the region's pre-contact settlement patterns. Urban development in Trenton has erased much of the area's original topography, although this early 19th century map helps to show what the landscape naturally looked like. So highlighted here, these red lines here show the contours of the original terrain. And this landform here is the slight knoll or hill landform that the Trent House was situated on and that Native Americans targeted for their settlement. The landform is level, well-drained, close to a fresh water source, the Delaware, and provides a good vantage point of the surrounding landscape. All of these factors made it a prime location for human settlement. The site's also not too far from the Abbott Farm Complex, which is a huge complex 
a pre-contact Native American site situated along the Delaware to the south between Trenton and Bordentown. Much of the interpretation for the Trent House site relies on its relation to this major complex. I also have a painting here that dates to around 1800 and shows a series of manors that were built along the Delaware at that time, providing a great look at the original shoreline and terrain in Trenton. The Trent House is shown right here where my cursor is. And you can see this landform that earlier people had targeted for their camp site. Our excavations in the summer of 2019 consisted of four five by five foot square units dug in one long trench in the south yard of the Trent House here, as well as six five by two and a half foot rectangular units dug on the western side of the house. The stratigraphy on this side of the house was relatively inconsistent and more complex than the stratigraphy in the south yard, the soils that were encountered uh, due to um, frequent episodes of construction and demolition on this side of the house. Uh, whereas we were able to hit a relatively consistent deposit of natural soils in the South Trench. This here is a photo of the wall of the South Yard Trench showing the nice layered stratigraphy that we encountered during the excavations. You can see all of these bandings of the soils that deposited on top of each other. And here is the interpretation of what a lot of these soil layers represent. So up top we have modern topsoil, historic fills of different kinds, and we have this light band here, which is interpreted as redeposited subsoil from the Trent House basement. So the Trent House is right over here on this side, and when they constructed the house and dug the basement, much of the soil would have been back cast onto the south lawn, creating this stratum here, and burying the original ground surface which is this natural buried A horizon. And because the Trent House was constructed around 1720, we know that this layer predates that time frame. And then we have naturally deposited alluvial B horizon subsoil here. So this is a diagram of the trenches west wall uh, marked with some of the temporally diagnostic artifacts that we found in each. Um, while there was a relatively small number of diagnostic material found during these excavations, we were able to notice a pattern in later material in this higher buried A horizon and earlier period material underneath it. So there is some vertical stratigraphy to this site that can help us uh, date the time periods represented. So investigations at the William Trent House up until 2019 have yielded a total, and including 2019, have yielded a total of 3,764 pre-contact artifacts. Um, for the purposes of my research project here and this presentation, I focused on analyzing the material that was recovered in 2019, which yielded 2,323 prehistoric artifacts. This table just gives a summary of the type of tools and materials that were recovered during that investigation. And here I just have a little selection of some of the more general tools that were found. Pictured here where my cursor is, is a gray argillite knife blade with a transverse break on it. Down here we have argillite spoke shaves. So a spoke shave is a type of flake tool with an intentional notch that could have been used to scrape wooden shafts, such as for a spear or arrow, to help make it straighter. This artifact could also be a um, notched projectile point fragment. And we also have here a selection of cobble-based tools. So things like hammer stones, uh, mortars and pestles and things like that. You see there's a little bit of battering damage on the cobbles here that suggest they were used um, as hammer stones and some polished surfaces on this side of the stone and on here that suggest they may have been used as a sort of grinding tool. Pictured here is a light gray argillite axe. Um, the axe head was manufactured by flint mapping, uh, where flakes were removed from the core to stone, were removed from the core stone to shape the tool um, and create a usable edge, which is relatively rare for axes in New Jersey, which are generally created by pecking, grinding, and polishing and sanding 
uh, a smooth axe edge. And the presence of the axe suggests that the Native Americans living at the site were capable of modifying the environment as necessary, clearing the area and utilizing the lumber as an important resource. Those were the fairly general tool types, but these are the artifacts that were found that we could place within uh, general time periods. So this uh, table includes some of the artifacts from the earlier investigations as well to give a more broad overview of the time periods that were represented at the site. Based on the results of our excavations, we were able to construct a very generalized cultural history of the Native American occupation of the Trent House, which spanned thousands of years before Europeans arrived. Uh, while Native Americans exist in New Jersey as far back as 10,000 BC and possibly even earlier, the earliest evidence at the Trent House for Native American occupation dates to the Middle Archaic period, which began roughly 6,500 BC and lasts until about 3,000 BC. During this period, the environment was becoming progressively more stabilized after the turbulent climatic shifts that surrounded the end of the Ice Age, and the water level of the river was likely stabilizing, creating a more constant shoreline, and the reduced flow allowed for seasonally migrating fish runs. Productive woodland and wetland environments were developing, and small bands of hunter-gatherers that lived here were able to sustain themselves by exploiting these natural resources. So only two Middle Archaic period artifacts have been recovered from the Trent House site to date, including this fragmented projectile point pictured here. Um, the split stem you can see on the bottom is what's known as a bifurcate, which is a style that was more commonly seen during the Middle Archaic period. And previous investigations also recovered a Morrow Mountain style projectile point, which dates to that period. The low quantity of Middle Archaic artifacts suggests that this location was not as intensively occupied at that point in time, and was likely a brief stopping point during the seasonal movement of Native American bands. The majority of datable projectile points identified in the Trent House assemblage can be rough, at least roughly attributed to the later Archaic period, which lasted from about 3000 to 1000 BC. The environment was even more stabilized during this period, which allowed for more productive woodlands and wetlands that could sustain larger populations of Native American groups. The datable point types that have been recovered from the Trent House from this period include Brewerton, Rossville, and Poplar Island, as well as some generic side notched, tapered, expanding, and straight stemmed points, um, a selection of which are shown up on the screen. Many of these types have very broad date ranges, but together they reflect a generally later archaic assemblage. We also found four triangular points, uh, two of which shown here, that demonstrate some of the characteristics that suggest they may have been earlier archaic age triangles. So archaeologists typically assume that triangle shaped points are attributed to later periods. But these are visually similar to some triangular shaped points that were found in the Abbott Farm complex to the south, which uh, had solid uh, date ranges that they were able to date them to, which was in the archaic period. The woodland period in New Jersey uh, lasted from about 1000 BC to about AD 1600, right up to when Europeans first made contact with the Native American groups of this region. The overall period is predominantly characterized by increased settlement and village life in the advent of agriculture. Um, the groups likely mix foraging activity with early agriculture to sustain ever-growing populations and settle in more permanent camps and villages. The Trent House site does not represent one of these larger village sites, and there's no evidence of agriculture found on the site, but the site like, likely represents a larger transient camp related to seasonal movements around the villages in the Abbott Farm to the south. The beginning of the woodland period is marked by the appearance of fired clay pottery. Um, this is an example of some of the pottery that was found at the Trent House site. Uh, also during the late woodland period, we see the advent of the bow and arrow and smaller triangular shaped points like this one here. So back to the pottery, this pottery was initially interpreted as potentially Abbott zoned pottery based on the different directions of the incised lines on the pottery but upon reflection, it looks like these designs are relatively evenly spaced and parallel. So it's likely that they were created using some sort of comb. So it's possible that these shirts actually date later to the contact period when groups would sort have of had access to that type of tool.
So the contact period in New Jersey starts roughly around 1600, uh, where the Lenape people that lived in New Jersey and the Delaware Valley came into contact with the first European explorers and traders. Um, the initial contact provided a variety of trade goods that Native Americans were previously unable to acquire, such as iron, brass, glass, and cloth. Certain contact period artifacts are a result of this cross-cultural trade. Things like glass beads, copper artifacts, and tobacco pipes were all commonly traded in exchange for furs, surplus corn, and deer meat. Glass and shell beads, such as wampum, were commonly used as currency in these interactions. So I have pictured here a small selection of the contact period material that was found at the Trent House in 2019. Um, pictured here on the top left is a very small blue glass trade bead that was recovered in the A horizon of the South Yard Trench, so that woodland contact period context. Uh, the bead shows similar styles to uh, other beads that have been found in Eastern Pennsylvania that have been dated around 1575 to the 1630s. So it's an incredibly early artifact uh, that predates the British occupation of Trenton. The British came into Trenton around the 1670s. So this bead is likely related to the initial Dutch trading endeavors in the Delaware Valley. And documentary research has suggested that there was a Dutch trading post uh, near the falls of the Delaware, uh, even though the location hasn't quite been pinpointed it's likely that this bead came from those early interactions. We also found two pieces of trade copper, one of which is shown here where my cursor is, um, which were found in the kitchen area to the east of the house. Copper, often in the form of copper kettles, was frequently traded to Native Americans and repurposed craft items such as projectile points or adornments. We also found three fragments, two of which here, of um, tobacco pipes of Native American style tobacco pipes. Um, it's possible that these date to the late woodland period, but they may be contact period European reproductions based on their association with the trade copper. They were found in the same context. So based on the currently available evidence from the site, the main occupation of the Trent House uh, site likely represents a transient camp situated near common Native American travel routes and focused on seasonal, terrestrial, and aquatic resource procurement. The variety of activities demonstrated by the material culture suggests a site with more diversity than a typical single focus procurement camp or workstation. This type of site was likely occupied seasonally and could probably accommodate multiple families and bands. Seasonally revisited sites were common during the late archaic period and continuous reuse over greater periods of time is suggested by the broad range of temporal occupation reaching as far back as the Middle Archaic and lasting until European contact. The site's location along a major river suggests a role as a larger principal settlement with an influential reach, extending inland towards smaller interior sites. Uh, the artifact of variability and multiple activities represented suggests a type of base camp. So the site likely represents a secondary base camp or a transient camp branching off from the larger, more extensively occupied sites to the Saf and the Abbott Farm Complex with occupation dependent on the seasonal settlement patterns and cyclical reuse of the site. So this map shows the Trent House site in relation to identified regional complexes of pre-contact Native American sites. The Abbott Farm Complex is shown here to the south and occupation extends to the north almost continuously along the Delaware River, represented here by the Douglas Gut complex of archeological sites, the Trent House site here, and some of the pre-contact sites that were found in downtown Trenton, such as at the old barracks site or at the state house garage. Uh, breaks between the sites are likely a result of urban development and disturbance carving apart the archeological record and occupation was likely relatively continuous along the entire river in prehistoric times. So while the Abbott farm sites represent a complex of densely occupied village sites, and related sites, the line of Trenton sites within its periphery typically reflect lower density occupations. The Douglas Gut sites demonstrate Native American presence during the Middle Woodland period and extensive occupation during the Late Woodland. Middle Archaic presence was also identified at those sites just like at the Trent House, but in much lower quantities. So the late archaic and early woodland components of these sites often demonstrate similar attributes to the seasonal transient camps located along the Abbott Farm High Terrace Bluff, situated just up here. And the Trent House site appears to represent a 
continuation of the same regional sediment patterns with these peripheral sites that are slightly lower density along the terrace bluff and extending northward along the river. The Douglas Gut sites and the Trenton House, Trent House site are likely representations of peripheral seasonal occupation related to the extensively occupied Abbott Farm sites. Late archaic and early woodland transient camps of the Douglas Gut complex, the Trent House site included, may have been established during fall or winter seasonal movements. Fall subsistence strategies were often focused on nut harvesting, mammal hunting, and fishing, which appears more reflective of the Trent House site, while winter encampments typically reflected smaller hunting stations distanced from major watercourses and along smaller tributaries. Warm seasons would have attracted local groups to larger sites within the Abbott Farm during migratory fish runs. And then the native groups would have traveled outward during the fall to locations such as the Trent House and Douglas Gut sites. These sites acted as smaller camp campsites from which groups could splinter off towards smaller specialized resource procurement stations during the winter months. The Trent House site has contributed to our knowledge of the pre-contact and contact period Native Americans that lived in the Trenton area, contributing to our understanding of their seasonal movements, site-specific activities, and relationships with major New Jersey sites, such as the Abbott Farm Complex. There is still a great deal of potential at the Trent House site for further excavation and analysis. In fact, just this past summer, Monmouth University and Hunter Research revisited the site and the results of that fieldwork are still being analyzed. The story of the Trent House site covers thousands of years of the Native American past before Europeans arrived and even has evidence of interaction between those cultures. So it's an incredible site that I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to work on. And that's all I have. I just wanted to very quickly thank uh, colleagues at Monmouth University, Hunter Research, and this part of the Trent House Association and the State Museum and Historic Preservation Office for their help in my research project. And uh, Sadie Dasovich, another important colleague that helped me. So thank you all so much. And that concludes my presentation. Richard, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll get to questions at the end of all three presentations, but very, very well done. Thank you. So now we'll go to our next presenter who is Douglas Almick, um, and his presentation is titled Lost and Found, Rediscovery of the 1616 Map of New Jersey. Douglas Almick oh. is the Resource Interpretive Specialist at the Middlesex County Division of Historic Sites and, His and History Services. He has previously been employed as a Deputy Director, Curator, and Assistant Education Coordinator. In 2006, he was an historical consultant for the Science Channel documentary film, Navy's First Sub, Hunt for the USS Alligator. And that film focused on the search for a Civil War submarine currently sunk off the coast of North Carolina. Doug is also something of an expert in another Civil War, on another Civil War era submarine, the Intelligent Whale. Um, without further ado, Douglas Alman. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to present my screen. Can we see that? Okay. Dr. I'm sorry, we're not able to see you. Not screen. yet. All right, hold on a second. Uh, there you go. Okay, all right, wonderful. All right, I am pleased to present Lost and Found Rediscovery of the 1616 Map of New Jersey. So in 1616, a master cartographer completed a map based on a trading expedition that took place a year before. It was officially identified as New Netherland. This powerful primary document showed settlements of the Muncie and Lenape throughout present day New Jersey, Manhattan, Long Island, Northern New York State, Eastern Pennsylvania, and the Northeastern part of Delaware. I'm going to focus on the expedition that led to the creation of the map. The detailed settlements included the cartographer, its elusiveness throughout history, and its proper place in the early history of New Jersey. So during the winter of 1614, Dutch merchant Adrian Block was in trouble. While he and his crew were exploring uncharted territory, his ship, the Tiger, caught fire and burnt to the waterline. 
They were stranded in an unknown land, not far from settlements of native people, which, of which they knew very little. Herman Hilbertson, a carpenter, was tasked to salvage what he could from the burnt wreckage and construct a new vessel. The En Roost, or Restless, believed to be one of the first, if not the first vessel built in the New World, was launched and led by Cornelis Hendricks. He sailed for two years and explored what would later be known as New Jersey. He even traded items with the indigenous people of the region. On the 19th of August, 1616, Cornelius Hendricks' report of his voyage and its discoveries was read to the States General. Cornelius Hendricks found a country full of trees oaks, hickory, pine, some of which were in some places covered with vines. In said country, there were bucks, does, turkeys, and partridges. And the climate of said country was very temperate, judging it to be temperate as that of Holland. His trade with the inhabitants consisted of sables, furs, and robes of other skins. He also traded kettles, beads, and other merchandise for three of his crew members who had been captured by the Minklas. This report was part of an application to expand the trading monopoly of the New Netherland Trading Company. In an appendix to that request, Hendricks included a map by Hessel Gerritz, a master cartographer. The map is the first complete map of New Jersey and one that identifies the locations of five indigenous people, five settlements of indigenous people of what is now New Jersey. The map shows also the first time Sandy Hook, uh, in this map it's called Sand Hook, is used. The writing on the center of the map, seen here, has been transla translated to read, Kleinitan and his companion have informed me of the location of the rivers and the settlements of the peoples they have found on their voyage, beginning with the Mohawks and heading inland and downstream along the new river to the Ugache, which is the enemy of the northerly nation. And I can presently not find other than two drafts of these maps with regard to the one that is partially a fair copy. And while I think the one with the drafts denoting the locations to be the most reliable, I find that the settlements of the tribes of the Senecas, Gashus, Capinaces, and the Hoticas should be shown as being a good deal further west in the country. So let's look at the details of the map. In the northernmost portion, you see the Maquas. These are not Lenape or Munsi, but Mohawks, spoke an Iroquois language, lived north of the Mohicans. The Mohicans are an Algonquin people. They occupied a large area of land and lived on both sides of the Hudson from the Catskills to Lake Champlain. Shown by four longhouses are the Senecas, who were not also related to Lenape or Muncie, but the Six Nations or the Iroquois League. East of the Senecas are the Waraneks and the Wanarawanka. The word Waranek has been translated to mean very fine stream, one without rapids, or may refer to the quiet upper course of the Wallkill River. The Asopas are located underneath the Waranak. The Asopas, Tapan, and Mahicans emigrated later to the Ohio Territory. The 1616 map is also the earliest reference to Esopus as a location by Europeans, which they identified as the site of multiple Indian communities. South of the Waranex are the Tapans. This was a universal term used by colonists to describe the local population living near present-day Nyack and on the west bank of the Tappan Zee. The word Tapan is derived from the Lenape word Tupan, which means cold stream issuing from springs. And the name was used for 20 years. East of the Tapans are the Wickagill. This is the location of Wickers Creek, a mile long stream that flows through Dobbs Ferry into the Hudson. It is an anglicized version of Wichake Wisek, meaning end of the swamp and the original name for Dobbs Ferry. South of the Tapans are the Makentawum, and nothing more is known 
other than the proximity to the Manhattas. The Manhats or Manhattan south of the Wickagill, that's, that's a well-known word. And in 1610, it was the first Muncie word recorded by one of Hudson's crew. And it is the only Muncie word that has not been removed from present day maps. And this has many meanings. It's known as a Northern Nami word. Um, the fluent speaker and Canadian scholar, um, Albert Anthony believed it to be place where timber is pronounced, uh, procured for bows and arrows. The Mora uh, Moravian uh, missionary, John Heckwilder, called it the island where all become intoxicated. And it's possible that he didn't translate it properly because he also, he frequently used man or mana with drinking. So that could have been where his mistake was. Southwest of the Manhattas are the Sanacons. They were known as people that, that lived near Sandy Hook and the interior of the country. It is a Muncie word, Flint Fire Striker. Uh, the Maquas and Muncies called the Sanacons Gunlock people. And the Swedish considered the Sanacons as important trading partners. A vocabulary book that translated the language of the Northern Unami stated that the Sonicons dwelled on the upper part of the South River, which has been later changed to Delaware River. Okay. And in 1616, this map is indicated by the arrow, the first use of Sand Hook, the 16, and I'll get closer, there it is right there. The 1616 map, again, first that uses Sand Hook. The 1614 map uses Sand Point. Now, to the east of the Sanacans are the Aquamachuque, where the Neversangs or the Naramsunk lived. It's possible that that is an altered word meaning Aquanotashashik, and uh, it is a northern Unami word. The, uh, the people who catch things with a net. The 1614 map showed that the Aquamachuque were farther west, but still living in central Jersey. Yes, that's a thing. And the Aquamachuque were also identified in two globes produced in the Netherlands during the 1620s. The author of the Muncie Indians of History, Robert uh, Grumet, calls that word a cartographic fossil. So uh, let's see, the Sawane, those are the Shawnee. The Minquas located in central New Jersey, you can see them on one of the lines and on the lower left in um, fortified villages. They were a large, powerful band also known as the Susquehannocks. They inhabited central Pennsylvania, controlled most of the indigenous trade and in northern New Jersey and southern New York State. They competed with the Lenape for trade in the Delaware Valley. And they were also known as vicious people. They attacked the Manhattas and the Raritans of Middlesex County. And even though there's no documentary evidence that states the Lenape or Munse lived in fortified villages, the Minquas, not related, did live in these fortified uh, little villages. So who created this map? Hessel Gerritz, but who was Hessel Gerritz? He was born in 1581, married in 1607, served as a printmaker's apprentice to the illustrious map maker Willem Janzo Blue, whom he had known since childhood. In 1612, he published a book, self-published, and it described one of the most remarkable accomplishments by a cartographer during the first quarter of the 17th century. The rare book exhibits the Northern Passage, and he was very interested in this throughout his career. And the publication also introduced Europeans to Russia. This was highly successful. It had four printings, two in Dutch, two in Latin, so that the work might be more accessible in foreign countries. In 1617, he was hired as the official cartographer and chief of the hydrographical office of the Dutch East India Company, as known also as the VOC. 
and he earned the appointment over his former childhood acquaintance, Blue, and Blue was too much of a free thinker. Also, his religious and political beliefs did not align with the Dutch East India Company or the VOC. In 1621, he became the chief cartographer of the Dutch West India Company, also known as the GWC. The Dutch East India Company was granted a monopoly for trade east of the Cape of Good Hope and west of the Strait of Magellan, and the GWC was granted a monopoly for all trade in the Atlantic Ocean. Here's one of his other maps, a map of the Pacific Ocean in 1632. It's, it's much larger, larger than this though. So to complete a map, Guess, uh, Gerritz relied on a wide variety of sources. He used journals, logbooks, coastal views, maps, archival records, and he interviewed hundreds of captains and pilots, and he kept all these notes in a journal that people can access today. And besides interviewing mariners and scouts, he even interviewed indigenous people when they were captured and brought back to Amsterdam. He frequently visited the East India House to look at manuscripts uh, that were English and examine Spanish sailing directions. And he reviewed maps that were uh, made by the man who was identified as the father, uh, the founding father of Dutch cartography, Petrus Planicus. The most important thing that Gerritz had to do throughout both of his jobs for the cartographer, for the GWC and the VOC was to practice secrecy. And because they were in competition with a lot of different trading companies and countries. And he received an annual salary of 300 guilders. In addition to the maps he was individually or as a group compensated for in uh, 1619 in October, he was paid 500 guilders for correcting a series of maps. But if he published a map without the permission of the board of directors known as the Heron 17 or the Gentleman 17, he could be fined up to 6,000 guilders. Upon his death, all the papers could be taken from his house, from either company. And if the company wanted to, they could inspect where he lived so they could get all his personal possessions that related to his work for one or both companies. So this map has never been identified or, uh, or published as a map of New Jersey. It is not featured in Snyder's mapping of New Jersey. Uh, unfortunately, it is not featured in the Mapping New Jersey book. And it, it's, known to, it's known to other people in the history community as a whole. Uh, the agent of the New York Historical Society discovered it in 1842. Um, it was featured in a book called Iconography of Manhattan. It's not mentioned in the WPA Guide to New Jersey, but, it, but Cornelius Hendricks is mentioned in the history section for the WPA Guide of Delaware. So this is an important map that people need to know about it. And it needs to be known as not just the first complete map, but one of the most important primary documents in New Jersey history. So I wanna close with a story. In 1988, Polly Miller, the director of the Ocean County Cultural and Heritage Commission wanted to find the map. And she looked for the map for two years. She had difficulty finding it. And she was commenting on this when she was speaking with Susan Halsey, who was a coastal geologist with the New Jersey, of Depart uh, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Ms. Halsey said, well, if you want, I can go and try to look for it when I'm traveling in Europe this summer. And Ms. Miller said, that'd be great. Halsey looked at two museums, didn't find it there. Went to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. The curator said, you should go to The Hague where the National Archives of the Netherlands is located. The archivist on duty brought the map, brought it down. Halsey got a, uh, a, a negative of it. She bought a postcard, wrote down, sit down, I found it to her friend, boarded a train, and that's it. So there's, the, there's a, a discovery of the New Jersey map and in the late 20th century. So that's my presentation. Thanks a lot.
Doug, thanks for a great presentation. What a wonderful map. Can't wait for the question and answer period so we can uh, we can learn even more about it. But that was that was great. All right, our uh, final presenter uh, this afternoon is Dr. Adam Heinrich, and his presentation is titled "Archaeology Revealing Lenape Horticulture uh, in the South of the Raritan River." Uh, Dr. Heinrich completed his PhD at Rutgers University, specializing in archaeology, zooarchaeology, and material culture. Uh, he's worked on sites and collections from Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and South Africa. And currently he serves an assistant, as an assistant professor in the Department of History and Anthropology at Monmouth University. Adam. Hey, thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I can't stop thinking about that map. <laughs> That's incredible. And uh, having worked in South Africa, the Dutch East India Company is, is pretty close to my interests. So <laughs> great to see. Okay. So my presentation is on archaeology revealing Lenape horticulture, or the descendants of the Lenape people, uh, south of the Raritan River. And so up until quite recently, maybe even still persisting, has been a, um, there's been a general depiction of pre-contact Native Americans living within the coastal plains of New Jersey, so the area south of the Raritan River, and also the complementary eastern side of Pennsylvania. This prevailing perception has been one of the indigenous people maintaining a more mobile forager lifestyle while aggregating to exploit anadromous fish runs while their neighbors on all sides, uh, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York, uh, even northern New Jersey, north of the Raritan, adopting horticulture during the woodland period as early as about 1,000 years ago. If, if the Native Americans in Southern New Jersey were growing any kind of domesticated plants, it has generally been hypothesized by some such as you know, scholar Marshall Becker, that it was simply a, as gardening. You know, it was a gardening type situation where foods were produced in minor quantities and consumed immediately. So basically this kind of fact that there might've been surpluses produced kept for um, sort of winter storage and you know, eaten throughout the year. Um, others, the archaeologists like Herb Kraft and Alan Mounier, postulated that botanical evidence for domestic cultigens were either not recovered due to cruder excavation techniques, or that the acidic soils erased their evidence. Um, and therefore, with that lack of evidence, it seems plausible that um, there was no horticulture practice on a large scale in the southern New Jersey area. Oh, shoot. I'm <laughs> out of practice. That was my slide. Um, so we... We don't have written documents from the Lenape perspective uh, during the pre-contact period, but when we start getting to the early historic period, uh, we see some, some scattered documents from you know, explorers and early colonists that reveal something about uh, the, the likelihood that Native Americans in the Southern New Jersey area, again, the, the inner, and out, inner and outer coastal plains were practicing horticulture, uh, particularly in a type of horticulture that would provide surplus and uh, allowed them to have a food store that would last them across different seasons. Um, and so um, the, the first visitor um, that we sort of will recognize here describing maize production is uh, the mate on Henry Hudson's half moon ship, a guy named Robert Jewett, uh, sailing in 1609. And by, by stopping along the Southern Raritan Bay, sort of where the area of the Monmouth County uh, the coastline would be, he said that they, they acquired a great store of maize or Indian wheat from people living in the Monmouth County area. So again, speaking to the fact that there was a quantity of maize being grown and available for trade. Um, after that, um, the first European ship recognized to have gone up the Delaware River uh, was this boat called the Isiran Farkin, uh, Iron Pig, um, sailing in about 1616. And they note that um, no other European was really on the Delaware River prior to that. Uh, Hudson sort of stops at the, the, the Delaware Bay, but doesn't go in because the shoals were a little dangerous. Um, but they do encounter a couple indigenous people who say that there were a few Dutch who arrived over land as prisoners. Um, maybe perhaps the people captured by the Minquas that was just talked about in the other uh, presentation. Um, but otherwise, um, what's interesting here is that there's no there's no record of an uh, intensive European presence that would sort of trigger um, you know, Native Americans perhaps to grow uh, maize in, a, in an intensive kind of way for trade. Um, so the first 
settlement type of situation that we see along the Delaware River is uh, Fort Nassau being constructed in the area of what's today called uh, Little Timber Creek, uh, actually pretty close to the site I want to talk about in Gloucester City, um, established in 1627, but it was quite irregularly garrisoned. Um, so you know, the Dutch are there for a short period of time with a small number of people. They seem to abandon it for a while and then go back. Um, following that, uh, we have the, another Dutch ship coming up, uh, captained by uh, David Petersoon de Vries. And he um, actually encounters a, a group of Lenape people within the abandoned uh, Fort Nassau. And there he, he describes them as the Armawaman. They were fugitives that the Minkwas, as we know, the Susquehannocks, had killed some of their people and they escaped. They had been plundered of all their corn, their houses had been burnt, and they escaped in great want. In that same voyage in 1633, February of 1633, De Vries encounters a canoe containing an old Indian and a squaw who brought with them some maize and beans of which we bought a quantity. So what's interesting about the De Vries accounts is that he's there in February and he's describing these people with surpluses of food, particularly a surplus of food that was attacked and I guess plundered by the Minqua. Following De Vries, an Englishman, uh, Thomas Young comes through and visits the Lenape people and he encounters, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, people of the river were at war with a certain nation called the Minquas, again called the Susquehannocks now, who had killed many of them, destroyed their corn and burned their houses. So, and Young continued to visit more Lenape groups up the river and encountered similar stories where people had been killed, their wigwams destroyed, and their maize fields destroyed or pillaged. So furthermore, Young encountered a party recently victorious. So he's, he's encountering a Susquehanna group who traded some of the maize that they had plundered from the Lenape. And so Young and De Vries are echoing each other, basically saying that there's um, significant fields uh, dedicated to the production of domesticated crops. And the Native Americans were relying upon these foods, particularly as um, sort of the food source or subsistence base over the winter seasons. And it's interesting is that these are occurring quite early on. We don't have sort of really significant European presence along the Delaware River until the little later 1630s when the Dutch start colonizing. And this is important to note now because you know, one of the hypotheses that the, the Native Americans were not engaging in horticulture until European arrival was because the Native Americans were gonna engage in trade. Basically they were cash cropping maize and other domesticated crops to exchange with Europeans. Um, but the fact that we are seeing these accounts prior to significant European presence here um, they're, they're, they're indicating that maize and beans and other things are being grown in sufficient quantities and they're being made, they're being grown for personal consumption. Okay, so um, Richard Groban Associates uh, several years ago now were able to excavate a, a site uh, in today's Gloucester City across four urban um, blocks of the city uh, in advance of construction for a school building. So you can see the on the map here, um, it's pointing to a a location uh, in the intercoastal plain, pretty deep into southern New Jersey there. So the the property was, again, Gloucester City was a quite urban place. Um, so it was pretty heavily developed in the late 19th century with uh, row houses. And also there's a furniture factory there, um, which polluted the ground pretty severely. But, um, but obviously it, it limits the amount of land that potentially could have been uh, excavated. But anyway, um, if we go back in time a little bit, a map from 1842 shows what this land could have looked like pr prior to this intensive development. And with the exception of one house up in the corner, it was otherwise a, a meadow. It was an open land. But what's really crucial about this 1842 map is that it shows this tributary stream along its southern boundary. Um, obviously, that disappears when the development occurs. It, you know, it's rendered extinct. It gets filled in. Now, I won't get into the minutia of the excavations and I, these maps are super busy, but you can sort of see the site areas that we were able to excavate in between uh, the now at that point demolished buildings. Um, we ended up finding five archeological sites. Four of them were identified as historic period sites dating to the mid to later 19th century, extending into the 20th century. And one site was identified as a Native American site. And if you see the map there, it's a block 86 site locus two uh, called 28 CA 129. But as we continued excavation, um, you know, well, the anticipation of finding historic period sites, we found that the historic period stuff was lacking integrity. There was heavy disturbance. It was really quite recent. So we, um, you know, we were sort of working beyond that. 
And as we were excavating, investigating historic stuff, we encountered Native American artifacts pretty much across the entire area. We, we found artifacts and we also found features. And so some of the key features that we found include six fire related features, uh, fire pits. Um, here in the, in the photograph, you can see one in the upper corner of this uh, excavation unit. And out of this particular pit, we had a good amount of charcoal as well as two fragments of really nice cord marked ceramic. As you can see a picture of one piece here, you know, beautiful sort of tw uh, twine like kind of cord uh, impressed into the surface. And this particular piece had a, a break on it showing you how these are made by a coil technique. And you basically you make snakes out of the clay and you sort of press them together. And this particular pot broke apart at one of those seams. But because we had a good amount of charcoal from these deposits, uh, we were really able to get some, some radiocarbon dates. And this particular feature uh, dates from about uh, what we call the, the middle woodland period. So if you were here for uh, Richard's uh, talk, uh, you see the middle woodland period is sort of like that 2000 to 1000 year ago time period. This particular fire pit dated to about 135 to 330 CE. Another fire pit that we were able to excavate, this one wasn't outlined for, uh, for the photograph, but you can sort of see that slightly redder uh, soil in the corner, the lower uh, left corner of the pit. Um, so again, another fire pit, this one seemed to have been a pretty intensive activity area. Uh, the soils around it had a debitage from sharpening tools. It also had a good amount of ceramic pieces. Um, but again, because it was a fire pit, we had some charcoal. We were able to get a radiocarbon date here at that sort of boundary, that transition between what we call the middle woodland and the late woodland period. So the radiocarbon date here is 995 to 1150 CE. Um, so while we were focusing on the historic period archaeological sites, we, we started, as we started recognizing the greater spread of Native American artifacts, we started to wonder what was happening in between the areas we had previously designated as site boundaries. And so we ended up doing a mechanical trench uh, between a pretty broad area that wasn't uh, identified as a site before. And as we stripped away the upper leg, upper lying fills, which were significantly thick, which probably limited the ability to identify sites uh, earlier on, we came across a great number of features. And I won't get into this because this isn't the uh, focus of this presentation, but uh, we ended up finding little sort of spots of soil color changes in the ground. And as we were clearing more and more of the area, we recognized that they were forming sort of oval clusters. And um, so through a variety of different kinds of analyses, so you know, shapes of these uh, soil stains, excavations of some of them, um, the, the, the profiles, the cross sections of some of them, we recognized that these are probably post and ground kind of structures and maybe something like a wigwam. And as we excavated them, we found absolutely no historic artifacts within them. Um, we found Native American artifacts in some, including charcoal. And the one we were able to get radiocarbon dated, we got a date for cluster two of uh, basically the end of the middle woodland, uh, just about at the beginning of the later woodland, about 885 to 995 CE. But what's really important about this is that not only did we get a, you know, these structures, which are themselves quite rare to find and get a, a really great date on them, but as we were excavating the post molds, we were excavating some of the subsoil, what would have been underneath these buildings. And we found more Native American artifacts, of course, speaking to earlier you know, occupation on the site before these buildings were put in. And this piece of ceramic shown here uh, was one found uh, within uh, these excavations. And it's a pretty, pretty interesting piece of ceramic um, because it is of a type, if I can get my note real quick, it is of a type called the Mockley type or type 1C according to Michael Stewart's typology, uh, which is also a middle woodland type of ceramic. It dates from about the year 200 to 800 CE. So that, per, that fits perfectly with our, our buildings on top of these things. Our buildings are from 885 to maybe a little bit later. This piece of ceramic type was manufactured up to about 800. So give a, you know about a century of time before the buildings come in. And so the, the artifact assemblage from the site is relatively different from other kinds of sites. Uh, it really was lacking in stone tools. We had um, you know, a couple uh, types of tools that might've been more of like scrapers, uh, as the stone tool shown here off to the right side of the, the photograph here is an ads like tool. So basically a scraper type of tool. Uh, we had a, a grinding stone. We actually had two grinding stones found, uh, but largely the, the artifacts were like kind of sharpening uh, debris. So what we call debitage or small flakes and, and also a lot of ceramic. And so 
Uh, with the artifacts, um, we, we selected some for specialized analyses. Uh, we took them and we, before you know, handling them with our bare hands and before washing them, we sent them off to a lab. Uh, and we submitted things for starch grain analysis. So basically microscopic residue that could be on some of these tools if they've encountered plants. And, okay, so this uh, table here is showing the starch grain analysis results. Um, we sent uh, the, all the tools on that previous slide, right? So we sent the two pieces of ceramic, uh, the Jasper biface, which was like an ads like type of tool and the hammerstone. Um, the ceramic pieces, unfortunately one, uh, which was the cord marked type, which was from that middle woodland uh, dated uh, fire pit, did not produce any identifiable starch grains. But importantly, the other piece of ceramic that we submitted, the one that was found in the subsoil below the house structure or the wigwam type of structure, that had a good range of identifiable starch grains on it, including uh, a type of seedy grass called a uh, little barley or wild rye. Um, basically, little barley and wild rye are two different types of plants, but they're kind of indistinguishable in their starch grain forms. Uh, we had bristle grass. You know, we, importantly, we had two pieces of maize or two starch grains from maize. The Jasper biface also contained um, a starch grain from maize, as well as a couple of damaged pieces. The hammerstone uh, did not have any identifiable maize, but it had starch grain from Jack in the Pulpit, as well as some little barley wild rye, suggesting that this tool was used to process these things. The Jack in the Pulpit is, is a poisonous plant, but um, if per, 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 what's the right word, um, prepared properly, um, it could have been used for medicinal purposes. And ethnographically, we do see it used uh, quite widely as, as a medicine. So in addition to the starch grains, we did send some, some bulk soil samples um, to, the, uh, to the analysis. And we were able to get some macro botanicals. So basically things that don't necessarily require microscopes to see. And we were lucky enough to have preserved seeds from some economically important types of plants. So here we could see a couple of them. Uh, we have Chenopodium, which is also called go Goosefoot or Lamb's Quarter, um, Eva annua, the sumpweed, um, and another piece of maize. And these were all coming out of a, the later woodland fire pit. So feature 27 that I showed a picture of before that nice red soil in the lower corner of the feature. So this is speaking to like, a, again, a later woodland period uh, use of domesticated crops. And we could recognize these as domesticated, well, obviously maize, you know, coming from its teosinte origins in the Mesoamerican area, it was, you know, we recognize that as, as domesticated, but the uh, sumpweed is not indigenous itself to our local area. It's more of a, a plant that grows uh, further south, maybe the Potomac River Valley area. And so the fact that we're finding it up here suggests you know, movements of these kinds of things uh, by people uh, you know, in the past. And Chenopodium, again, is a well-known uh, oily kind of seed uh, that Native Americans were using for a long period of time. But in addition to these, we also had uh, evidence of um, carrot, a wild type of carrot, uh, aster, and evening primrose. So a, a range of uh, other kinds of economically important plants. Along with the macro botanicals, we did also send the soils, the soil uh, samples to be examined for micro, uh, micro botanicals. Uh, but here, we were able to look at something called um, uh, phytoliths. So there are silica crystals that develop within plants. Um, and being silica, they're relatively inorganic. Or they are inorganic, and therefore they preserve pretty well. And the two soil samples that were submitted for phytolith analysis, one sample was sent from that middle woodland fire pit, uh, feature 57, which had the nice pieces of ceramic in it. The second sample was submitted from fire pit 27, which is the one radiocarbon dated to 995 to 1150. The phytolith results provided additional evidence of economic plants, including hackberry, sunflower, and the first known example of squash, cucurbita, uh, in the intercoastal plain. The squash phytolith specifically comes from the rind part of the fruit. The sedges, uh, as shown in the table here, were, uh, were coming from uh, the seeds. Um, and so the presence of the site close to that tributary stream suggests that they were probably exploiting some of the uh, marshy kind of plants as well. Okay. So while the macrobotanical and microbotanical evidence for cultigens may seem scant, again, we have like you know, one piece of one maize starch grain here, two maize starch grains there. We have one phytolith from a, a rind of a, 
of a, a melon here. Um, so while the macrobotanical and microbotanical evidence for cultivants may, cultigens may seem scant, we must remember that only a small amount of material was able to be studied. So you get a, a small handful of soil samples, a small a number of artifacts. So with that in mind, archeologist John Hart, who works up in New York State mostly, reminds that the recovery of cultivated crops remains are dependent upon archeological sampling techniques uh, relative to the density, distribution and preservation of those remains in the archeological record. So therefore he says, the recovery of any crop remain from a location that reflects a fairly high level of use. And sort of as a point to this, the Burnham Shepherd site, which is up in Connecticut, has one of the largest archeological collections of maize in the entire Northeast region. And there over about 1,500 kernels of maize have been found. But if you sort of do a minimum corn cob count here, that's recognized to be the equivalent of only between five to 14 ears of maize. And again, so a pretty limited quantity if you think of it in that sense, but it does speak to the likelihood that maize was a very intensively produced and consumed food there. So while the finds of sunflower, squash, and others are significant in the phytolith samples, the phytolith results from feature 27 and 57 provided compelling evidence of increased landscape clearing throughout the woodland period. Grass and tree phytoliths are the predominant type of plant uh, types represented, and together they demonstrate an inverse relationship when the proportions of grasses, where the proportions of grasses increase from 66.5 to 78.4%. While the proportions of tree phytoliths decreased from 26.8 to 12.3 percent. So unfortunately the grass phytoliths were often not diagnostic enough to narrow down to the species of grasses present, but they revealed that the landscape was largely open with some stands of pine, probably oak, and as phytoliths generally don't filter down the sediment columns you know, through rain, water, and things like that, um, they indicate the landscape was open during Native American occupations and that it became more dominated by grasses over time. The consistently greatest proportion of the phytoliths from both features are from the economically important Panacoidea grass family, which includes maize as well as bristle grass. A greater than fourfold increase was observed in the percentage um, of another important grass family, the Puidae, which includes little barley and wild rye. The starch growing results already showed that maize and bristle grass and little barley and wild rye were processed and consumed by Native Americans at the site. And so that they may be very well represented in these sort of less diagnostic phytoliths. So sort of uh, going along with the stuff that we were seeing here at Gloucester City, um, a notable recent geological piece of work was done in the Northern Delaware Valley uh, at the Raymond's Kill Creek area, where it's shown that evidence of, it shows evidence of increased sedimentation caused by Native American land clearing for horticultural practices. And what's really interesting about the the work up in Norman's Kill is that they're seeing this increased sedimentation occurring around that year 1000, which coincides with the data feature 27, which is radiocarbon dated to 995 to 1150 CE, demonstrating an increasingly cleared landscape at Gloucester City. So in summary, the finds from the Gloucester City site uh, could be a start to move away from the mobile forager hypothesis for late pre-contact Native Americans of the lower Delaware River Valley. Archaeobotanical finds indicate the middle through late woodland Native Americans uh, more heavily relied upon cultigens than had previously been assumed. Finds of maize, sumpweed, chenopodium, little barley or wild rye, sunflower, squash, and bristlegrass reveal subsistence strategies that significantly incorporate starchy and oily seeds that can provide staggered results between spring to autumn harvests. The Gloucester City site, which on this map here is listed as 28 CA129, now establishes this deep in the intercoastal plain where previous finds at uh, like the Livingston site or the Gully site, which is 28 MO351, are at those fuzzy boundaries with neighboring physiographic provinces. So they're pretty close to like the Piedmonts the part of the state. Um, and the site south of the Gloucester City area, uh, 28 GL304, was from the contact period. So um, that's when we definitely have European presence in the area and therefore uh, the movement of maize, the growing of maize could have been quite different then. Um, so changes in phytolith frequencies along with the post moldex evidence shows the site to have been a relatively specialty site where field structures may have served people, particularly women uh, who are planting, tending and harvesting their horticultural fields in proximity to the tributary stream uh, of what we now call Little Timber Creek. So additionally, the finds at Gloucester City highlight the need for attention to microscopic evidence present in soil samples and on artifacts. It has been evident that macrobotanicals, such as those expected in the northern Delaware River Valley, where we do find more 
you know, solid evidence of you know, burned maize kernels and things like that. Um, yeah, you may have to focus on the microscopic in the southern New Jersey area to more fully understand the lifeways and subsistence practices of people and the roles of cultigens and also wild plants. And so what's heartening is that since this work has been done, uh, another Richard Grubb and Associate project uh, did examine starch greens at a site in what is today Hazlitt. Uh, so on the map here, it's uh, noted as 28MO449. Um, and so at that site, they they submitted a couple artifacts, including a piece of firecrack rock and maybe a piece of pottery, I think it was. Um, and they were able to find more maize. Um, and so it, it, it provides us another data point demonstrating the deep history and widespread production and use of domesticated plants by Lenape or their ancestors in the Southern New Jersey area. And the, the recent finds in Hazlitt is really interesting because I, the date of it is, is significantly early. It's not near the contact period, it's somewhere late woodland, but um, that we're finding maize being present in the Northern Monmouth County area is interesting because again, when Robert Jewett and Henry Hudson come up to that area, they're able to acquire maize from Native Americans from that general region. Okay, and, and lastly, uh, thank you uh, for coming to my presentation. And thank you so much. That was a great presentation. And now uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, for all of our presenters. And um, the first one that I see here is from Megan Kassebaum, uh, and it's for Richard Adamsick. Um, and it is, I'm curious if you found any intact archeological features that might indicate anything about either structures or storage practices um, at, uh, at the Trent House. And to, to all of our uh, presenters, um, Feel free to uh, turn your cameras back on and un unmute yourselves. So, Richard, what do you what do you think? Did were there any structures or things that would speak to storage practices at the Trent House? So, uh, during the twenty nineteen excavations and all prior excavations, there were no definitive uh, prehistoric features that were identified. There were a few cobble concentrations that were kind of up in the air as to whether they were cultural or naturally deposited. Um, I'm not sure about the more recent excavations in 2021. There may have been features that were identified there. I wasn't particularly heavily involved in that project. Yeah, we did, we, we had, I don't believe we had any pre-contact features this past year. Mm -hmm. We certainly had a wide array of um, historic features. You're forgetting about the giant pit in the unit I dug. Oh my God, I am forgetting about the <laughs> giant pit in the unit that Adam dug. We did have one really big uh, feature that Adam would like to speak to. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's inconclusive. Uh, the artifacts in it suggested uh, like an early woodland period. We had a little teardrop uh, biface in there. Um, otherwise there wasn't a lot of artifacts in it, um, but it was huge. It was, I don't know the depth of it. It was three feet deep maybe. If I'm thinking about the original ground surface, not where the mm -hmm. modern ground surface is, it was probably about three feet deep and it might've had an eight foot diameter. Um, so what that means, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, good point. Thank you for reminding us about that. Uh, another question was uh, where was copper first mined uh, or when rather was copper first mined by the Lenape and from where? I don't know oh. if any of our panels want to take that. Um, I'm, I can speak at least a little to it. I'm not yeah. the expert on pre-contact copper. Uh, there are others that could speak to it more, but I do know that um, copper was identified in deposits dating at least as far back to the late archaic period in the Abbott Farm complex. So about 3000 BC and later. Um, I'm not entirely sure if the Lenape did mine copper here. I know there were, are some geologic sources of copper in the mid-Atlantic, but generally it came from the Michigan area and was traded to this region. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's largely accurate. That's what, that's my understanding as well. There are copper deposits uh, embedded in some of the sandstone deposits of northern New Jersey, which were also uh, mined, but I think most of the copper has been sourced to the upper Great Lakes area. Um, and Greg Latanzi at the State Museum is is the leading expert in that in that field. Let's see if we have any other uh, questions in the Q and A. Well, 
I don't see any more there. So while we're while we're waiting, uh, Doug, with your presentation, um, so the 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 Maquas or the, the Mohawk folks, are they up? I was just trying to orient myself with the map, which is so fascinating. Are they sort of Hudson Valley, Albany area, Albany Kingston area? Is that is that about right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Maquas uh, next to the Mohegans, that's in the northern portion of the map. Right, yeah, yeah. And this is sort of speculative, but also for you, Doug. Like, I mean, do you think it's worth... Um, historians, perhaps yourself, like heading to the Netherlands and, and going through those early records at The Hague to see if there are other sources that relate to uh, the early colonial history of this area. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Um, I, I, I think one of the questions I had that I, that I typed was, how has it been lost for so long? It, it was entitled at the Netherlands National Archives as part of New Netherland part of newly discovered country. So I, I think that it is just, it was, it's been filed and considered just part of New York history because it was New Netherland. Right. But when you look at it and when you look and see sand hook, or even when that wording is too small, you see that hook right in Monmouth County and you're like, oh, and, and you see Cape May, I just said, oh my gosh, that's not new. Well, that may be New Netherland at one point, but that's Jersey. So Right. Yeah. So and, Very good. I mean, yeah. Karen Reeds has another question for you. And so how did you learn about the Gerritz map and <laughs> where can we learn more about it? Is there uh, maybe a New Jersey studies article in the offing or something? Uh, yes, um, I'm working on that uh, right now. Um, how did I learn about the Gerritz map? I was <laughs> I was I was researching the Dutch East India Company and its maps online at the National Archives. And I just wanted to see what, and the Dutch West India Company, and I wanted to see what they had online in terms of collections. And I've, I've seen a lot of early maps of Manhattan, like the Costello map. And I said, I wanna see this, these other maps that are of New Netherland. And I clicked on it, 1616, and, and I thought, and that's when I saw it. And it was an amazing aha moment, so. Yeah. That's um, such a great find. Yeah, Garrett's, um, he's amazing. Uh, Kees van Vliet wrote a chapter on 17th century Dutch cartography. And Garrett's is the, the father, he's, he's the expert. He is the, the, the individual who is making these maps for two extremely powerful corporations. He dies in 1632. Uh, most of my work from him comes from two articles, one from hope I'm saying this right, Imago Vundi, uh, it, it, I think it's a map publication, and, and the other was the chapter that Keith Zonvli did on all of the, um, the, the protocol and the procedures that had to do with maps, and it was extremely uh, detailed, and the uh, captains had to give maps into the company when they returned from their voyages or else they had to give in three months wages. So there were really hardcore corporate policies that people, including Garrett's, had to abide by. Wow. Um, so we're almost out of time for uh, questions. Um, Adam, there's one for you. Were you able to determine whether any of your non-maize seeds, kinopodium, et cetera, that do grow in the wild around here were examples of domesticated uh, varieties. Right, um, so well, well, some of them like the sumpweed and the sunflower, for example, are, are not indigenous to the area. So they coming in from trade or movement of people or whatever it is, but yeah, chenopodium, which is really prevalent locally. Uh, the person who analyzed the botanical remains of Ruth Dickow, um, she, looked at the sizes of these seeds and when you talk about domestication there's often a, an intentional selection for larger seeds or maybe seeds that have different morphologies that will allow them to either you know, stay on the shaft better or fall off the shaft easier depending on what you want um, and so by the appearance of the seed you know the size of it and stuff like that uh, she felt pretty confident that it was probably being uh, domesticated okay very good and actually add one more for you have you found any uh, evidence of use of smartweed, a site in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, shows that as well as lamb's quarters and Turk's cap lilies. Hmm. 
Um, no, I don't know smart weed. Um, again, I know it's like a rel relatively prevalent weed <laughs> around here. So, um, but our site, I don't think we had uh, strong evidence for it. And then one more broad question that really any, any of the panelists could take. What is the most current thinking about how paleo ancestors first came to New Jersey? What was, what was their route? To do a seminar on that, but I don't know if anyone wants to uh, step in just for a second on it. I guess I could. Um, so obviously, we acknowledge that Native Americans came out of Siberia across um, either a land bridge or along the coast. Uh, the evidence nowadays is looking pretty good for a coastal route, at least sort of hopping along. Mm -hmm. uh, but once they're south of the big ice sheets, uh, the, the Paleo Indian Native Americans were were quite mobile, and it seems that they favored really productive land. So they really sort of moved along watercourses with really sort of rich landscapes. And eventually they end up populating North America and you know, eventually South America as well. Um, so they probably came into New Jersey you know, from the West, you know, following along major watercourses until they eventually hit to Delaware. And you know, nowadays, if we look where a lot of these, you know, obviously we're, we've lost a lot probably because of sea rise um, with the, through the Holocene period. But uh, you know, a lot of the key sites where we find like Clovis points and things like that are you know, along waterways. You know, the, the Manasquan River, for example, seems to be pretty, pretty rich. Um, so they seem, they seem to be doing that. They're coming out of the West, but following major water courses. Thank you, Adam. Well, thanks to all of our panelists uh, for a terrific session. Um, look forward to hearing more about all of these projects. Yeah. And uh, there is a new, uh, our final afternoon sessions will be beginning soon. So uh, thank you again. And thanks to all of our attendees. See you soon.